I invite you, if you would like, to follow along in your pew Bibles, to grab your pew Bible with the, to read our scripture reading. Uh, you'll also find it on the cover of your bulletin and on the screen behind me. If you're at home, it'll be on the screen for you as well. But if you have a Bible at hand, we encourage you to open up to our reading. Our scripture passage this morning is in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 8 through 19. The book of Proverbs is right after the book of Psalms. So uh, if you are opening your Bible, just flip open to the middle and you'll probably be in the book of Psalms and go one book to the right and you'll find uh, Proverbs chapter one, beginning in verse eight. Hear, my son, your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants around your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed, indeed. Well, this morning we're beginning a, a, a short series, a three-week series called Money Wise. As long as humanity has had money and possessions, we have also struggled uh, to balance that and to be healthy with that. Many today seem to think that the economic and consumeristic challenges that we face in our culture right now are unique to our time and age. And yet, again, as long as there has been currency and possessions, we've struggled to handle those things appropriately. It truly is a tale as old as time. And so we turn to help, to find help from ancient wisdom to guide us in even these modern times. And there are few places better to find such wisdom than the book of Proverbs written by the wisest of the wise, King Solomon himself. This, uh, today, we are looking at the opening verses of the book right off the bat, right after the opening statement, the declaration that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The very first thing that Solomon brings up is a warning about being consumed by wealth and possessions. And if there's anyone who should know how dangerous that is, it would be Solomon the greatest, the wealthiest, the richest of all of Israel's kings. That is just one of the first things Solomon, that this is one of the first things Solomon addresses, gives us a hint of just how important this is, how much of a perennial problem money and possessions are and can be in our lives. As we look at Solomon's warning in the book of Proverbs this morning, we will see that we are freed from being possessed by our possessions when we hold fast to the kingdom of God. Would you take a moment to pray with me? Lord God, we come to you and to your word this morning, grateful as we always are for your son, Jesus Christ, and for the salvation that we have in him. We are grateful to you for your word that is such a boon to our souls. But sometimes, Lord, we forget that your word is also full of very practical, in some ways worldly, wisdom. Wisdom inspired by your Holy Spirit. Wisdom that is as timeless as you are. For it is wisdom from you. So, Lord, this morning, by your spirit, would you soften our hearts? Would you open our eyes? Would you unplug our ears 
to hear, see, and receive the wisdom you have for us, Lord. As we are reminded of the perennial problem of our greed and our selfishness. And the wisdom you've given to us to avoid the danger that lies therein. Lord, may all that is said from this pulpit and all that is done over the course of this day be for you and for your glory alone. It is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. Question for you, especially you movie buffs. What do the Great Gatsby, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, and the Lord of the Rings, we'll just say all three of those, have in common? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to actually answer it because I'm going to tell you. Whether it's the temptation of the treasure of the Black Pearl, a long sought for and coveted one ring, or the idea that wealth and possessions define our worth and our value, each movie shows how quickly and how easily our desire for wealth and possessions can become an all-consuming quest that ultimately can never be satisfied. Having stolen a treasure that didn't belong to them, the crew of the Black Pearl find themselves literally trapped between life and death, unable to die, and yet not able to truly live either. The One Ring gives unnaturally long life to the person who possesses it, but at the same time, it twists and focuses the bearer's will into an obsessive need to keep the ring to himself. And the hedonistic pursuit of excess and pleasure in the great Gatsby is ultimately revealed as immoral, vapid, and shallow. Across each of these, we see over and over again that our desire to consume ends up consuming us. Some argue that this is a unique problem to our age, or more specifically, that is the it is the natural result of a capitalistic economy and culture. But I think that is a wildly naive criticism. Humanity's struggle against greed and consuming isn't new. It has been part and parcel of our broken and fallen nature for, well, pretty much as long as there have been people on the earth. It is about as close to a timeless and perennial problem as we can get. And that's why, as we mentioned just a moment ago, Solomon opens his collection of proverbs and wise sayings by addressing this very issue. It isn't just that he starts off by warning us of what happens when we are possessed by our possession that shows the depths of his wisdom. It's actually how he presents his warning to us as well. Using the vehicle of a father passing along sage counsel to his son, we are drawn into the tale, eager and ready to receive what our wise father wishes to pass along to us. After all, since neither the parents nor the son are identified in any way, for all we know, it could well be our parents trying to pass along this wisdom to us. Through this unidentified father, Solomon issues a forewarning, followed by a description of a seductive situation, a warning of the trap that awaits us for it in that situation, and he concludes with a final warning. Solomon begins by saying, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. First, we are reminded of the value of receiving instruction from our parents. This counsel, listening to the advice, the wisdom of your parents is uh, worth adhering to because Solomon says it is a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Right? I mean, when your parents give you advice, they're like, oh, that is such a great garland on my head. Thank you. That's the first thing you think, right? Every, no, this is weird. Kind of strange. 
imagery. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us today. But 3,000 years ago, when Solomon wrote these words, it would have made perfect sense to his audience. These two things are symbols of honor and life that are not to be discarded. In ancient cultures, a garland was worn on the head of heroes and of champions, and a pendant was worn around the neck for guidance and for protection. So what he's saying is when you listen to the counsel of your parents, when you forsake not their instruction and teaching, it will pr uh, protect you. It'll protect the child from danger. It will guide them in the paths of wise living. It will enable them to not just live, but live triumphantly like a hero, like a champion. And the first thing that the father does is provide a warning to his child about the dangers that lie ahead. Forewarned is forearmed. It's actually something I do, uh, try to do for my children, for my family, um, as often as I can. Uh, particularly, uh, one of the things that we do when, when my family goes on road trips and I'm not able to join them, I love uh, stalking, I mean, following them on their trip uh, and watching their progress. Because part of what I also do is I like to look ahead for them at what traffic situations are coming up so that they can know what's coming and how much of an issue it might be for them, trying to give them warning about what's ahead so that they can be prepared to deal with it once they get to it. It's one of the great things about our GPS unit on our phones, right? Is we get to know those things now. You remember 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you'd go on a road trip and you'd get stuck in traffic and you'd have to just sit there and wait and never know what's going on. Now you can find out exactly what happened and still be stuck there waiting and not able to do anything about it. It's fantastic. Don't know if it's actually better. But that is a thing that's true about life. Forewarned is forearmed. When we know there's danger coming, we can prepare ourselves for it and be ready to deal with it when it comes. And the warning that the father gives is concise and to the point. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Yeah, it's a hypothetical situation, of course, but it is also far, far too real and happens far too often. Are we not enticed to sin on a regular basis? Does it not come up for us almost each and every day? And in spite of this warning, in spite of knowing it's going to happen, how often do we find ourselves falling into it? We are surprised every single time even though we know better. It's as if this warning is too vague in some respects. So the father spells it out. He lays it out for the son. He lays it out for us. He tells us the seductive situation that lies ahead and he describes it quite vividly. If they, the sinners, say, come with us, lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole. Like those who go down to the pit, we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. The father skillfully unmasks the reality of the seductive situation being offered by this gang of sinners. Now, of course, rarely do sinners show their cards this blatantly. But these are nevertheless the temptations of wealth and possessions. Instead of honoring the humanity and dignity of other people around us, they are reduced to obstacles to wealth and riches that have to be dispatched. It isn't fair, after all, that others have what you do not. You deserve it more than they do. Why? Simply by virtue of the fact that you don't have it and they do. That's all it takes. So it does not matter what lengths you must go in order to obtain it. Why work hard and earn anything for yourself when you can just take what someone else has? Alas, notice 
that these acts of thievery and murder are not spontaneous. They are cold and they are calculated. As cold and calculated as the temptation to join them is. What's the promised reward? What are they enticing you with and offering you? Once you throw in your lot with this gang of miscreants, they offer to share their plunder equally with you. At least, that's what they tell you. Of course, we never have to deal with anything like this, do we? Nobody comes along and tries to entice us in such a way. Except maybe every single commercial that we see on TV every day. Promising the same thing. Well, minus the thievery and murder. Right? Maybe. Maybe not. A seductive situation indeed. So the father doesn't mince words just in case the unmasking of the seductive situation in the previous verses wasn't clear enough. The father continues, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. It's a trap. But it's not the trap that the sinners think it is. They're clueless to the consequences of their deeds. Not just in terms of the wrong that they're inflicting on innocent people. But more importantly, they are clueless to the damage that they are doing to themselves. Not only is what they are doing wrong, it frankly is also stupid. The sinners plot a trap and ambush for their victims. Not realizing that they're actually ambushing their own lives. They think their crimes will enable them to live large, but all that waits is the loss of everything that makes life worth living. Having illustrated his message, the father lays out the consequences of the warning in verse 10. What happens when we consent to being enticed by sinners? Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. They say the uh, best way to get your point across to somebody is to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. In this case, the father has basically repeated his point four different times. But just to make sure the son doesn't miss the severity of the situation, the father drives his point home. Brothers and sisters, greed only ever leads to death. It is the only place it goes. When our objective is increasing our possessions and our wealth, we sacrifice our soul, if not our lives. So who is this gang that is trying to tempt us into thievery, murder, and worse? How could any sane person ever fall for such blatant evil? The reason is because the temptation rarely comes that blatantly. The consequences are never spelled out, spelled out that honestly. Look at the seductive power of the one ring in Lord of the Rings. As Gandalf says, when Frodo offers him the ring, Gandalf, you take it. I don't want it. I can't handle this. You take it. Gandalf says, with that power, I should have power too great and terrible. And over me, the ring would gain a power still greater and more deadly. The way of the ring to my heart is through pity. Pity for weakness and the desire of strength to do good. Do not tempt me. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe unused. The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. I shall have such need of it. Great perils lie before me. So he refuses. In their quest for the treasure of Cortez, the crew of the Black Pearl failed to see the trap that was laid out for them in wait for them. Not just the curse of the pearl, 
of the, of the treasure on them, but also the willingness to commit mutiny first and murder second to gain the treasure. And as the story unfolds, failing to see the danger ahead, we increasingly see how the greed for unjust gain strips away the life of those who pursue it in the great Gatsby. Sometimes metaphorically, and ultimately even literally. The danger we are warned of in these verses is real, and we all know it, and we all struggle to recognize it before we fall into it. Given the inability of humanity of all stripes of all ages to avoid being tempted by greed and wealth throughout history, what is one to do? Ultimately, I think it comes down to a question of what kingdom are you trying to build? The temptation of the gang of sinners, the temptation of our culture is about building your kingdom here on earth. And it is a seductive situation and it is so, so subtle. It's, it's not so much that I want a kingdom for myself. I don't want a kingdom for myself. I know that would be a terrible thing. You do not want me to be king. But it would be nice to provide for my family. That's not so bad, is it? I'd like to be able to provide a better life for my children. That's not a bad thing, is it? It's not a bad thing, I don't think. The problem is, that's how it starts. But it's not how it ends. If we focus on our own kingdom, even for the best of reasons, we risk losing it all. We need a better focus. We need a better kingdom to build. And that kingdom is the kingdom of God. As Jesus says in Matthew 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Brothers and sisters, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. If we want to avoid the temptation and the trap of the gang of sinners, of wealth, of possessions, we need to decide first, which master are we going to serve? Christ or self? The kingdom of God or the kingdom of me? Once we determine which kingdom and master we serve, we set our eyes on that goal. We go where we look. You ever notice that when you're driving? Driving down the road, cruising on the highway, you see uh, a beautiful vista off to the side. You're like, wow, that's really beautiful. Right? And all of a sudden, you're three lanes across the highway and everybody's mad at you. And you're like, I don't know what happened. You go where you look. Right? We're wired that way. What are you looking at? What eyes have you set? If all we're doing is looking at our stuff or our lack of stuff or our desire for more stuff, we will walk in right into the trap that these sinners are trying to entice us to go into. If we set our eyes on the kingdom, if we set our eyes on the kingdom of God, then we will lay up treasures in heaven rather than on earth. Keeping our eyes on the kingdom of God, placing our treasures there, investing in the kingdom enables us to see more clearly the temptations of this life. The ultimate futility of focusing on worldly gain and wealth for the seductive trap that it is. And Jesus promises when you give everything to me, you will see, receive back far more than you could ever ask or dream or imagine. But if we keep it to ourselves, we risk losing it all. Brothers and sisters, when all is said and done, truth is true. 
regardless of the era in which that that truth was found. The seduction and temptation of wealth and possessions is persistent, pervasive, and perennial. The details might change, but the danger is always the same. And the way to protect ourselves from the danger and avoid the trap is to choose to serve God and not money. To set our eyes on Jesus and him alone and invest and lay up treasures in heaven and not on earth. May God bless each one of us as we are set free from being possessed by our possessions by holding fast to the kingdom of God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, as with so many other things, these are easy to say and so hard to do. So much harder than we often think. So, Lord, I pray for your spirit to fill our hearts and our souls, to set our eyes on Jesus and when our eyes wander, to bring us back, to keep us focused on you and on your kingdom, to remind us that to gain the world is to lose our souls, but to gain you is to gain everything else. After all, Lord, all that we have, all the things of this world are, were never ours to begin with. They were only ever yours. So Lord, we give back to you that which is yours. And we trust in you to provide for our every and very need. Thank you, Lord, for being such a generous God. May we always be satisfied with you and you alone. It is in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray this morning. Amen.